I have to say, it is a, a tremendous honor to be here uh, this afternoon with you, and I mean that sincerely. Uh, I see myself as really just an uh, ordinary local church pastor, um, and that's what I do each and every day. And for those of you who are pastors here, uh, my heart goes out to you. Uh, this has been a very difficult season over the past few years. It's been less difficult for us in Florida than it has for you in Michigan, those of you who are from Michigan. But this has been a very difficult season to serve God's people, to strive to keep the church uh, together, unified, from people not hating each other, dividing from each other, growing in vengeance and anger. Um, it's been a difficult season. If you're an elder, if you're a deacon, if you're a pastor, uh, these have been difficult times. And they've been difficult for all of us. And so if you're not a pastor, if you're not an elder, or please, please encourage your pastor. Please encourage your elders. Please encourage your officers. Please encourage the staff and the receptionists who've received all sorts of different calls and issues and problems from within the church and outside the church. Another reason I'm very grateful to be here speaking on this is that the mission of God is one of my... Uh, my favorite things to talk about. Uh, it really is and has been the heartbeat of my life and ministry for uh, all my life since becoming a Christian. Uh, the focus of my doctoral work was on the mission of God, and I'm grateful that we are addressing it here this afternoon. And so the passage that I've been assigned is from Romans chapter 10. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to look at this entire passage in the depth that I would like, but we are going to look at some of the major portions of it as we strive to understand better how we as God's people are to be faithful in fulfilling the fullness of the great commission of Jesus Christ, how we are to be faithful in fulfilling the mission of God. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 14, and I'll read through verse 17. This is the word of God. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. This is the holy word of God for you, his holy people. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the way in which your word sanctifies us, for the way in which your word convicts us, challenges us for the way in which your word encourages us and edifies us. Lord, we need your word desperately, and we ask now in the reading of your word and the hearing of it and sitting under the ministry of your word, that you would help us, Lord, to become greater lovers of your word, hearers of it and doers of it as well. And that in doing so, Lord, you would help us to love you more with all our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves for your glory and your glory alone. Amen. Now, if I were to ask you what is one of the most difficult chapters in all the Bible, I imagine that many of you would say that Romans chapter 9 is one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible. Now, depending on which side of things you're on when it comes to Reformed doctrine of salvation or Reformed soteriology, that some of you might say, well, it's not a problem for me at all. I understand it, I believe it, I grasp it, and I teach it. But for many, many Christians, and likely for many of you once upon a time, just as it was for me once upon a time, Romans chapter 9 was a very difficult chapter of Scripture to understand, but more so to believe. Now, one of the things that we fail to grasp and consider when we look at chapter 9 is how Paul begins chapter 9 and even how he ends chapter 9 and into chapter 10. Look with me just quickly at the beginning of chapter 9. 
There in verse one of chapter nine of Romans, Paul writes, I am speaking the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now, let's stop there for just a moment before going to verse two. Why is Paul saying all that? Why does he use these qualifiers like great sorrow and unceasing anguish in verse two? Why does he speak of, of not lying and his conscience bearing witness and saying that he's speaking the truth? Well, of course you're speaking the truth, Paul. We wouldn't expect anything less from you. It's because Paul really wants us to pay attention to what he's about to say, and he wants us to take him seriously. He wants us to know that he's not just saying this, that this really is how he feels. And how does he feel? Verse 2, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Do you hear Paul's heart here, his, his true anguish and sorrow over those who are dying without knowing Christ? And then again, at the end of chapter 9, of course, with no chapter divisions in Paul's original letters, at the beginning of chapter 10, as we read it, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Again, expressing his heart for his kinsmen, for all who would be without Christ. And one of the questions that I ask myself and our congregation from time to time, and I think that we would all do well to ask ourselves, is do we have truly a heart for those who are dying without Christ? Because if we don't have a heart for those who are dying without Christ, if there is not a deep anguish and a sorrow for those who are dying apart from knowing the gospel, we may not know the gospel ourselves. Amen. If we don't have a burden for those who don't know Jesus, it may in fact be the case that we don't know Jesus. Paul had this heart, and this all surrounds this great and beautiful but very difficult chapter 9 of Romans where Paul lays out the beautiful theology of God's sovereignty in all things, in particular in salvation. And then he answers the necessary question. The question that's on everyone's mind, if they're reading through Romans 9 carefully and studying it well, they come out saying, well, wait a second now. If God's sovereign, well, then why do we have to do anything? If God's sovereign in salvation and he saves whom he saves, if he's merciful upon whom he's merciful and hardens whom he hardens, then why do we need to do anything? Why do we need to evangelize? Why do we need to pray for those who don't know Christ? Why do we need to translate things into Spanish, into Portuguese, into Mandarin, and so on? Why do we need to do these things? Well, Paul answers the question. Now, many have tried to answer this question, I think sometimes very poorly. Because in dealing with the question of God's sovereignty and salvation and our responsibility as his people, many have simply tried to answer that by looking at what they would call an apparent contradiction and say, well, that's really all that it is. And we just have to believe it. We have to accept it as an apparent contradiction and go with it. Now, I know that's a bit simplistic. But the reality of it is, is that God ordains not only the ends of all things, he also ordains the means of all ends. And so in truth, it's not a, a, an apparent contradiction. It's a mystery that we in our finite minds cannot fully comprehend. But what we do understand is that God has ordained the ends, he has ordained salvation, but he's also ordained the means of that salvation. And so what we're talking about here in chapter 10 and what Paul's addressing in a very beautiful but tightly logical way is how this happens. Now most of us in reading this in chapter 10 say, well, of course, we understand that. We get it. But it's an important answer to an important question. It's almost as if Paul is taking us by the hand, almost as if we were elementary school children after he's just come through this tremendous chapter 9 and said, okay, let me explain this to you in very simple terms. You know, you know now, you now understand that God is sovereign in salvation. If you want to know how people get saved, 
Well, here's how it happens. So Paul is giving to us, in very simple terms, the means that God has ordained in the ordinary way that God saves. This is the very simple and ordinary way that God saves. And God tells us that we have to use words. And so Paul reasons, beginning there at chapter 10, again, verse 14, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? Now, before going on, we need to examine just a couple of things here because we usually skip over this. We say, well, we get it. But what is Paul saying there? He says, how then will they? Who are the they? Well, the they he's just outlined really throughout the entirety of Romans thus far, but particularly there in verses 5 through 13, it's everyone whether Jew or Greek, anyone. Now, this is the problem that many Jews had because they thought fundamentally that the Messiah was coming just for them. That's why Jesus was a conundrum to them and why he frustrated them to no end because Jesus was coming and going to people like the Samaritans whom the Jews hated. Jesus was coming and cleansing the temple in the outer courtyard of the Gentiles because that was to be the place not for busy bustling, noisy commerce, it was to be the place where the Gentiles, where the nations could come and pray to Yahweh. And they didn't like that Jesus was saying things like he did to Nicodemus, who maybe didn't really fully understand the gospel's for everyone. For God so loved the world that whoever believes would not perish. For the Jew, this was difficult to understand because to them, their Messiah was coming to save them, to lift them up, to make them the conquering nation, the promised people of God, and to overtake Rome and all of their enemies. That's why they want to make Jesus their national leader. They were confounded by the fact that he wouldn't be their national leader. They didn't understand that his kingdom was then being inaugurated, that it would continue to grow, and that it would finally and fully be consummated in the end when he returns. They couldn't grasp this, how some poor, unaffluent, uneducated, sort of a country bumpkin redneck hick from Galilee, filled with fishermen and hunters and gatherers, how he could be their Messiah. So Paul lays out here that It's to everyone. Now, we understand this. But for many Jews, and there were many Jews that were coming back into Rome after the Edict of Claudius had ended because he died, and as many of these Jews were hearing this, they were coming to grasp and coming to understand that this Messiah, that their Messiah is the Messiah for the world. And so Paul is saying, how are they gonna hear? How are they gonna know? How will they call? Now, Paul uses a word that we typically pass over. But what does that word mean? What's its significance? Well, we can go throughout the entirety of the Bible, Old and New Testaments, and we can look at numerous passages where we read about calling on God or calling upon the name of the Lord. And we see God's people throughout history when in times of deep distress, in, in need of rescue, in need of redemption, doing what? calling upon the Lord. Now, most people that we come across in our lives, in our spheres of influence, most people don't really think they need to call on the Lord. They assume that they're good. God's good. I'm good. He's a good God. He's a loving God. He created me. I'm a good person for the most part. Why wouldn't God love me? And so most people just assume they're good with God. They assume they're okay with God. We talk to people like this all the time, don't we? They say, I'm good. God's good. I'm good. We're okay. We have an understanding. You hear people say this, I'm a spiritual person. I have a relationship with God. What you need to tell those people is like, everyone's a spiritual person. You're either worshiping God or you're worshiping Satan. I love this one. Well, I'm a man of faith. That's nice. Faith in what? Faith in whom? It means nothing. It's meaningless. 
Most people don't think they need to call upon God, but the reality of it is is that each and every human being needs to call upon God. And this is helpful for us as we contemplate the realities of those who are in places, in countries, in villages, in far off continents, and even in places in our own neighborhoods where people have never actually heard the gospel. Now, truth be told, 30, 40 years ago, most people in America, in most of our communities, maybe not California, Bob, but in most other places, In most other places, you could say, do you know the gospel? And most people had heard the gospel. Because most people had been in a church where they had heard the word of God and they'd heard the gospel or the basics of the gospel or things about the gospel. Generally speaking, I'm being extremely charitable here. But today, that's not the case. You don't know who's actually hearing the gospel anymore, and just because they're going to church means absolutely nothing, because just because there's a church in every corner, anywhere you are in America, doesn't mean the gospel's preached in every corner. The reality of it is, is that even 20, 30 years ago, we could say to people, hey, I hear you're going to that church over there, that Bible church, that Baptist church, that Presbyterian church, and you could at least know for the most part that they were probably getting the Bible and some gospel thrown in. Today, that's not the case. You don't know if people are hearing the Bible. You don't know if people are hearing the gospel. And the truth is today, people don't think they need to call upon God. But each and every human being, wherever they are, needs the gospel. And I realize that many who are still asking the question about the supposed innocent native in South America and the Amazon or the innocent native in a small village in sub-Saharan Africa. But here's the problem with that. They need the gospel too. They need to call upon God as well because the reality of it is is that there's no such thing as an innocent native. As Paul lays out in Romans 1 through 3, every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has fallen short. And if the truth of the matter is that they're gonna be saved without hearing the gospel, well, why would we go? Why would we go and give them an option and risk them not receiving the gospel? Risk them rejecting the gospel and coming under the judgment of God. Well, they're under the judgment of God, and that's why we go. We go because they need to know that they need to call upon God. We need to go, and we need to send, and we need to do all that we need to do in fulfilling the fullness of the Great Commission because people don't even know that they need to call. So Paul reasons, how then will they call on him on who they've never believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they've never heard? It's hard for us to imagine the unreached peoples who've never heard the gospel. Now we realize that in history, even in the apostolic era, that the gospel in many ways went to the uttermost parts of the earth. There's a very important point that we need to understand. I'm preaching right now through the gospel of John in the mornings and in the Acts of the Apostles on Sunday evenings. And one of the things we're seeing on Sunday evenings is how the gospel is going, in one sense, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Even as Philip ministered and baptized to the Ethiopian eunuch who went back to Ethiopia and was very likely the first missionary to Africa. And at that time, Ethiopia was a mighty, mighty country with a mighty army and very wealthy. He was the first missionary likely to Ethiopia and to the rest of Africa. But it's hard for us to believe that there are people who still haven't heard the gospel. But more and more we're seeing this and more and more we're understanding this, especially when you go to Central and South America where really the Reformation is coming for the first time. They never really got the the, the full effects of of the Reformation, again, kind of like California. (laughs) This is why Bob is still there. He's on a mission. He sees himself as a missionary to California. (laughs) 
But in the truth, the, the Reformation never really, really had an impact there. They never, it never really took hold there. People never really heard about Jesus and trusting him and the simple gospel of believing him and nothing else. And so Paul continues his reasoning. He says, and how are they to hear without someone preaching? Now, other translations say, how will they hear without a preacher? And that's really not the best translation. This is a better translation because I think many times when we read that, how will they hear without a preacher, that most of us immediately think of those who are ordained pastors, ordained ministers. I think that's how many Christians think, that it's the job of the pastor, it's the job of the preacher. Well, first of all, we need to understand that Preacher is not an office in Scripture. The office in Scripture is pastor. Preaching is something that pastors do. But it's very important that we understand that and make that distinction. Because the reality of it is, if my job were only preaching, my job would be pretty easy. It's the pastoring that's hard. It's the shepherding it's the shepherding among shepherds and the shepherding alongside of shepherds, the shepherding walking among the sheep, the daily work of getting dirty and hurt. That's the work of the pastorate. Every one of us is a preacher. Every one of us is called to preach the gospel, proclaim the truth. Now, some of you say, well, I'm not very good at that. Or I don't really have many opportunities for that. Do you have any opportunities ever? I'll tell you what. Coming to corporate worship on the Lord's Day, coming to gathered worship, is in part fulfilling the fullness of the Great Commission. Because what does a Great Commission call us to do? As Dr. Nichols mentioned earlier today, it's about discipleship. Discipling, and what does discipleship entail? It entails Learning, as Jesus said, teaching them to do what? Teaching them to observe or keep or guard all that I've commanded. And what we're doing every Lord's Day in part is coming together and learning from Christ and his word all that he has commanded, learning to keep it, learning to guard it, learning to observe it. And when you come to worship on the Lord's Day, you are in part Fulfilling the Great Commission by being there, by growing as a disciple and coming under the training of the Word of God. Mothers, when you teach your children the Bible, when you teach them memory verses, when you pray with them, you are fulfilling the Great Commission. The ordinary work that we do and the ordinary lives that we have in sharing the gospel with friends, in encouraging brothers and sisters in Christ, in encouraging our pastors, in speaking truth to them, in taking opportunities when they arise to present the gospel, to proclaim the truth, to give a rebuttal, to declare the antithesis, to say, that's not actually, that's not actually true. Or that's not actually what we believe as Christians. Well, let me tell you what Jesus said. These opportunities that we have in our lives are preaching, teaching, proclamation opportunities, and we ought to pray for them and look for them. And when we do, you should not be surprised when the Holy Spirit brings them your way, because he will. He'll bring you down paths and down roads and into stores and beside grocery store clerks and with conversations that you never imagined you'd have. Most days I try to go to the gym and I never anticipated the number of opportunities I would have to talk about the gospel and the things of God in the gym. It's just been fascinating to me and it usually begins by saying to someone, how are you doing? And I'm not, I'm not in some inauthentic way trying to, to weave something in or push something. And I actually do care about people. I want to know how they're doing. I want to know if they're okay. Sometimes it's a few conversations. Sometimes it's over the course of several weeks. Sometimes it's someone finding out I'm a pastor and saying, will you pray for me? I'm depressed. 
I mean, things that people open up about. We're all preachers in that sense. And in that sense, we're all on mission. Now, we may not want to say that we're all missionaries per se. If we want to reserve that language for foreign missionaries, that's fine. But we are all on mission. You see, we are all ambassadors of Christ. We are all his witnesses to the uttermost parts of the earth. How are they here without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? And this is an important point, and it goes to what Dr. Godfrey was speaking of earlier and the importance of the local church and the authority of the local church. Notice that they're sent. One of the greatest problems that we have in the church in many parts of the world, not just in Africa, not just in Central and South America, but right here in these United States is self-appointed preachers, self-appointed prophets, and self-appointed prosperity preachers. They're not sent No one sent them. They're self-appointed. Maybe a group has gathered around them and sort of lifted them up, but they've not been sent by an authoritative body of believers to say, go and preach the gospel. I'm speaking in general terms, of course. There are exceptions. But they're sent. We send missionaries. We send pastors. We commission them with our blessing, with our funding, We send them off with our prayers and with our love and care. And if you're not going yourself and you're staying, then your call is to pray and to give generously, to support, to come alongside. And quite frankly, just what Chris was talking about and what Humphrey and Manny were talking about here is what we're trying to do. As we're trying to send things Send resources to help pastors and missionaries wherever they are, indigenous peoples preaching the gospel, planting churches in their own communities so that the Great Commission might be fulfilled, so that God might be glorified, and the end for which God created the world might be fulfilled. So we send, we go, we support, we give, This is what God has called us to do as it is written. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, I realize that some of you have been studying the Bible a lot longer than I. And the truth is that even in our own congregation, we have so many wonderful saints, many of whom have been studying the Bible since long before I was born. And I've talked with them over the years and I love, I love hearing, I love sitting under and with and listening to older saints. I love to hear them pray. I love to hear them talk about the Lord. I love to hear them talk about the Bible. I learn from them regularly. This is one of these passages and one of these verses that all my life, for the most part, coming to this verse, I've always thought, what on earth does this mean? What What do beautiful feet have to do with the preaching of the gospel? And for years it puzzled me. It still puzzles me a little bit. But before we get to that, I want to ask the question about what it is we're called to preach. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news? Paul says that it's by the preaching of the good news, that's how faith comes. So faith comes from hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the good news. Hearing the word about Christ or the word concerning Christ. It's the gospel, the good news. Well, what is the good news? I bet if I went around the room today, and I realize that we come from different backgrounds, different denominations. Uh, Most of you, I trust, have been Christians for many, many years some perhaps are younger Christians, newer Christians. But if you're here at Ligonier, National, or Ligonier Conference, my guess is you're pretty well steeped in the gospel. You know what it is. Perhaps you've taken courses. You could explain it quickly. But I have found in my life that many people, many people don't, really actually know what the good news is. Now, not any of you, of course. 
But let's talk about it for just a moment. First of all, we understand that it's good news. The gospel, and we could deal with the etymology of that word, which we don't need to, but good news is just that. It's news that is good. You say, okay, we got it. Let's move on now. But we have to think about that for just a moment. What does that mean? It's, it's good news. It's news that is good. It is an announcement. It is a message that is good. Now, when you look at the term gospel or good news as it is here in Romans 10, and you consider it throughout the New Testament, the truth is, is that the, the, the word is used to describe a few different things. Sometimes it's used to describe uh, the entirety of a gospel account, such as Matthew's gospel or John's gospel. Sometimes it's used to speak of the entire teaching of Jesus' ministry, everything that he taught. Sometimes, as Paul uses it, I think even in Romans, he's using it to speak of the entire message that he's bringing and all the theology that comes with it. It seems to me that in Romans, when he speaks about the gospel that's the power of God into salvation, notice he doesn't say the power is in the preacher, the power is in his charisma, in his personality. The power is in how good looking he is, how articulative communicator he is, how eloquent he is. The power is in the gospel. That's where the power is. That he's speaking of likely his whole message, everything that he's bringing in his letter to Rome. But when you drill down to what Paul is dealing with here in Romans 10 and how it's, it's used here, it seems that what Paul is doing here, what he's saying here is he's, he's giving to us the, the, the most basic, the most basic explanation, definition of what the gospel is. It's good news. That it's the good news of what God has done for his glory through his son, our savior, by the power of the Holy Spirit, all that God has accomplished to bring that about. The life and ministry, the death, the resurrection, the ascension, the promised second coming, the inauguration, continuation, and the building and consummation of his kingdom. That this is good news. Now, a lot of people say, well, is that it? Well, we could add different aspects. We could talk about different things. We could look at some of the biblical definitions of how Paul sort of gives to us sort of summaries of the gospel about Christ's life, death, and resurrection. But at the end of the day, the good news is just that. It is the victorious announcement of what God has done. Now, you notice something. I didn't mention, just hang with me here. I didn't mention repentance did I? I didn't even mention faith. I didn't mention taking up your cross and following Christ. You see, those commands, and notice they're commands. They're not simply invitations. Jesus never invited anybody to come to him. He commanded it. That's why Paul uses the language here They've not all obeyed the gospel. That is to say, they've not all heeded the gospel. The gospel is something that must be heeded. It must be heard, and it must be answered. It must be obeyed. We're not simply sharing a little good news and saying, well, you can do what you want with that. I mean, the, the kind of stuff I see in an attractional type church is, well, try Jesus. Stop it. You don't try Jesus. You come on your knees repenting of your sins and trusting him and surrendering yourself to Jesus. You don't give him a try. That's what I can't stand about so much of what we see in evangelicalism from the bumper stickers to the t-shirts and the billboards. Most of it is not the gospel. And I love it. I live in the country. I love going through the country and seeing a sign up on the side of the road that says pray. It's like, great. Any Muslim could answer that. Repent. Great. It's not the gospel. Seeing billboards along Interstate 75, at least down in the south, with all sorts of things, all sorts of good biblical passages and truths, not the gospel. 
The call to repent, the call to believe, the call to follow me, as Jesus said to his disciples, the call to take up your cross, the call to die to yourself, all of that comes right on the heels of the gospel. It is a necessary part of the preaching of the gospel, but in and of itself, it's not the gospel. You see, the gospel must be preserved as that good news. Notice that in the good news, the announcement of what God has done through Christ for his people comes with no threats in it, no warnings in it. It's good news. Now, the threats and the warnings follow the gospel. They follow the proclamation of the gospel because if you do not receive and heed the gospel and obey the gospel, you will all likewise perish. That if you do not heed this gospel, if you do not receive this good news that's for you, then you will suffer the eternal judgment of God in hell. Because you are a sinner and you are in need of God's mercy. You are in need of God's grace. You are in need of salvation. You are in need of having to call upon God. And if you don't respond to this gospel with humble obedience and a contrite heart and brokenness over your sin, here are the threats, here are the warnings. This is the judgment of God. Now, in our day, people don't want to hear that. People don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear about hell. They don't want to hear about God's wrath. They don't want to hear about condemnation. They want to hear about salvation, but nobody wants to hear what we're actually saved from. And if you and your church or your pastor, if you're not hearing words like sin or hell or judgment... You may not be hearing the gospel. And so understand that all of these things come, all these things are are attached to the preaching of the gospel. But it's very important that we preserve, as our faithful forefathers have throughout history, preserve the good news of Jesus Christ. It is good news. It is an announcement. And the, the way in which Paul brings us to this announcement through the lens of Isaiah 52. If you want, in your Bibles, turn there with me. In Isaiah 52, notice that Paul quotes Isaiah 52 and then just a moment later quotes from Isaiah 53, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Who has believed our report? But Isaiah 52, one of the most significant chapters in the Bible, we hear this news in this announcement to Israel, they were captives, exiles, slaves in Babylon. And now they are being brought back home. They're coming back to the promised land. They're coming back to Mount Zion. They're coming back to the place of God's salvation. They're coming back to Jerusalem. And this was the good news and the announcement of the Messiah who would come. And here's what we read in Isaiah 52 in verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. About 500 years before Jesus was born, there was a battle. It was one of the battles, one of the earliest battles between the Greeks and the Persians. You might have heard of it. It was at a place on a plain called Marathon. The Greeks 
only about 10 to 11,000. The Persians who had come ashore with their cavalry, numbering about 15,000, about 25 or 26 miles from Athens. The Greeks, all the men, all the teenage boys, all those who could fight, went to the front lines with their spears and their swords, figuring that they would all be slaughtered. That their women, that their children, their mothers and grandmothers would all be made slaves as the Persians were taking over the world. And one morning they woke up, according to legend, and they looked at the camp of the Persians and they saw that the cavalry was nowhere to be seen. And they realized it was their moment, their opportunity. And so they went in and attacked the Persians and ran them out of Greece. More than 6,000 fierce warrior Persian soldiers were slaughtered. And as soon as they won the battle, what was the first thing they did? They sent a messenger to run those 26 miles, thereabouts, all the way back to Athens. And as he ran as fast as he could, you can only imagine his exuberance and excitement with his feet, because they ran with bare feet in those days, bloodied and bruised with thorns, dirty, grimy feet, running all the way back to Athens, and as he made his way close to the city, and as there were likely watchmen, likely probably little boys or older men, there were standing guard watching for these runners. And they would see him, and they could see him at the tops of the hills with sand being kicked up from his heels, running with excitement and joy and happiness and and saying something they probably couldn't hear at first, but as soon as they heard the message, the battle is ours, we've won, we have taken the enemy, we're saved. You see, the watchmen, the first thing they could see was the sand and the dirt being churned up from the runner as he came upon the hills, as he came upon the plains, as he came upon the mountains, running to his city to give the good news. That's why Paul with Isaiah can say how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings the good news. When that runner came back to Athens, as legend goes, from exhaustion, he later died. You can imagine that his feet didn't look very beautiful. And what we have to understand is that the bloodied and pierced feet of our Savior were beautiful. Because Jesus came not only to bring the gospel, to proclaim the gospel, but that there might be a gospel to proclaim. And all that we do, all that we're called to do, is tell everybody about our Savior. I love what Zinzendorf, Count von Zinzendorf said at some point in his life from Moravia. As a pastor, he desired simply to preach the gospel, to die, and to be forgotten. We will all die unless the Lord comes first and we hope he does. But our lives, our legacies, who we are, the time that God has given us, let it be time given to pointing people to Jesus. Yeah.
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Lord, help us never to lose our love and astonishment of what you've done for us in Jesus. Help us never to be bored by it. Help us ever to grow more familiar with our Savior and what you've done for us through his life and his death and his resurrection. Lord, give us hope, give us joy, and when people see us, may they know that we are the heralds and the witnesses of our Savior. Lord, may it all be for his glory, and in his name we pray, amen.